Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. So today we're getting into Plato's Apology and we are again using the Loeb edition and for those of you who do not have the text, there will be a PDF link in the description box. Um, also, um, if you like what you're seeing, I do hope that you will um, hit the like button and think about subscribing and if you have any questions or comments about anything that we talk about here, please leave comments below for me. And um, one final administrative note is that uh, we, I will still be putting out videos. I have one about dream analysis, which was a request, and that will come out sometime in the next few days, so please look for that. Okay, so today we're going to get into the apology. And um, this one here... It's not really a dialogue. It's basically Socrates talking to the jury. Um, a few historical notes. I'm not really a historical person, but um, just a few things that we can find from the introduction and other places where this has been written about is that there were 501 jurors who were voting on this. And um, we're going to see that Socrates was up on you might think of it as two charges or three, depending how you break it up. But he was accused of, um, of corrupting the youth, and he was accused of not believing in the same gods as the state and believing in other spiritual beings. So there's a two-part there. So you may think of it as two separate charges or one charge with two parts to it. So it's either two or three, depending how you break it up. And he has, and there are three people who brought charges against him. Uh, we met Anatus in the dialogue Mino, and we saw that he was a prominent Athenian, somebody from maybe a wealthy family. And then we're also going to meet Miletus, who is a poet, and uh, Lycon, who is described here as an orator, or in some translations, a rhetorician. So we're going to see why it's significant that these are the people bringing charges against him. All right, so shall we get into it or any comments to make before we get started? That's yeah, let's, let's okay. go. Okay. All right, so basically it's just a, a monologue. Um, Miletus has a few words in here, but very little. So basically maybe we can just take turns reading. So... Who would like to start us off? Uh, just to confirm, we're reading the archive one, right? Uh, yeah, it's the Loeb edition, yes. There are many in the archive, but the one that I put the link to was the one that okay. came out of this Great. book. Yes. The yeah. page numbers are a little different, so I think the one I'm going to put in today's video was going to be a different edition to download. Okay. But yeah, but it's the same text. So okay, so I, I'll, can I start then? Can you start? Yes. Please, please, thank sure. you. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. The defense of Socrates at his trial. Mm -hmm. How you, men of Athens, have been affected by my accusers, I do not know. But I, for my part, almost forgot my own identity, so persuasively did they talk. And yet, there is hardly a word of truth in what they have said. But I was most amazed by one of the many lies that they told when they said that you must be on your guard not to be deceived by me because I was a clever speaker. For I thought of the most shameless part of their conduct, that they are not ashamed because they will immediately be convicted by me of falsehood, by the evidence of fact, when I show myself to be not in the least a clever speaker, unless indeed they call him clever a speaker who speaks the truth. For if this is what they mean, I would agree that I am an orator, not after their fashion. Now they, as I say, have said little or nothing true, but you shall hear from me nothing but the truth. Not, however, men of Athens, speech is finely tricked out with words and phrases as theirs are, nor carefully arranged, but you will hear things said at random with the words that happen to occur to me, for I trust that what I say is just, and let none of you expect anything else. For surely it would not be fitting for one of my age to come before you like a youngster making up speeches. And, men of Athens, I urgently beg and beseech you if you hear me making my defense with the same words with which I have been accustomed to speak, both in the marketplace and at the banker's tables, where many of you have heard me, 
and elsewhere not to be surprised or to make a disturbance on this account. For the fact is that this is the first time I have come before the court, although I am seventy years old. I am therefore not a foreigner to the manner of speech here. Hence, just as you would, of course, if I were really a foreigner, pardon me if I spoke in that dialect and that manner in which I had been brought up, so now I make this request of you, a fair one, as it seems to me, that you disregard the manner of my speech, for perhaps it might be worse and perhaps better, and observe and pay attention merely to this, whether what I say is just or not, for that is the virtue of a judge, and an orator's virtue is to speak the truth. Okay, let's stop here for a moment. So, yeah, very good. Um, so we're seeing a little bit here. This is sort of just an introduction. There's not a whole lot to say here, but we see that Socrates is now 70 years old, and he's about to now to give us the order of his defense. And by the way, if either of you have any comments to make anywhere along the way, just feel free to jump in. Okay. Um, but for now, Arca, could you please continue? Yeah. First, then it is right for me to defend myself against the first false accusations brought against me, and the first accusers, and then against the later accusations and the later accusers. For many accusers have risen up before against me before you, who have already been speaking for a long time, many years already, and saying nothing true. And I fear them more than Anatus and the rest. But these also are dangerous. But those others are more dangerous, gentlemen, who gained your belief, since they got hold of most of you in childhood and accused me without any truth, saying, there is a certain Socrates, a wise man, a ponderer over the things in the air, and one who has investigated the things beneath the earth, and who makes the weaker argument the stronger. These men of Athens, who have spread abroad this report, are my dangerous enemies. For those who hear them think that men who investigate these matters do not even believe in gods. Besides, their accusers are many, and have been making their accusations already for a long time. And moreover, they spoke to you at an age at which you would believe them most readily, some of you in youth, most of you in childhood. And the case they prosecuted went utterly by default, since nobody appeared in defense. But the most unreasonable thing of all this is that it is not even possible to know and speak their names, except when one of them happens to be a writer of comedies and all those who persuaded you by means of envy and slander, and all some also who persuaded others because they had been themselves persuaded, all these are most difficult to cope with. For it is not even possible to call any of them up here and cross-question him, but I am compelled in making my defense to fight, as it were, absolutely with shadows and to cross-question when nobody answers. Be kind enough, then, to bear in mind, as I say, that there are two classes of my accusers. One, those who have just brought their accusation, the other those who, as I was just saying, brought it long ago, and consider that I must defend myself first against the latter. For you heard them making their charges first, and with much greater force than these who made them later. Well then, I must make a defense, men of Athens, and try, and must try in so short a time to remove from you this prejudice which you have been for so long a time acquiring. Now I wish that this might turn out so, if it is better for you and for me, and that I might succeed with my defense, but I think it is difficult, and I am not at all deceived about its nature. But nevertheless, let this be as is pleasing to God. The law must be obeyed, and I must make a defense. Good, thank you. I'm going to stop there for a moment, because now we find that what Socrates is really planning to do here is not to defend himself against the charges brought against him, but to remove the prejudices that you have a long time acquired. And so that's really what, the di what he's doing in this dialogue. So let's go back for a moment just to make sure we're all on the same page, we're all following this well. So what is the prejudice against him? Jacob, do you want to jump in? Sure. I, I guess it's the... Uh... They, they don't like him for uh, speaking ill of the gods or, you know, questioning so much. Okay, well, if you go back a page where he talks about the earliest prejudice, what is that prejudice against him? 
So you speaking ill of the gods, that's the charge that's brought against him now. But there's a prejudice that he wants to fight. He says, this has been put in place first, and you have this idea of Socrates, and this is really what he's on trial for. What is that prejudice? It, they're calling him a sophist, aren't they? Saying that he makes the weaker argument the stronger. That is one argument against sophists, that's true. Um, but notice that people like Gorgias and Protagoras are never brought on trial. So what's the difference? Right. Mm. I mean, I figured that mm -hmm. yeah, was that the, part the trump up charge. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that is part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a certain Socrates, a wise man, a ponderer over the things in the air, and one who has investigated the things beneath the earth, and who makes the weaker argument the stronger. So he's like a kind of witch or a sorcerer. <laughs> the way they're describing him is, it's not at all like what we think of as a philosopher or what we think of as what Socrates right. is really doing. So they fear him. And he says that there are a number of dangers. So right following that quote that I just read, um, he says, these men of Athens who have spread abroad this report are my dangerous enemies. And there are a number of reasons. One of them, I'll give you the first one, is that he made, they made these accusations a long time ago. And that's part of the danger. It's been around a while. So people have been hearing this. When you hear the same thing over and over, it starts to sound like truth. So that's one of the problems, one of the dangers. What other dangers are there of these prejudices? Perhaps that they're spread so anonymously that there's no one to actually contest by debating them. Right, yes, there's nobody to actually talk to. He's fighting shadows, he says. And a little above that, he also says that they were spoken to you at an age in which you would believe them most readily. And this idea of childhood being the time when we take in beliefs comes up in other dialogues as well. Do you see anything more there? It's really just a reading comp question. Do you see anything more there in that section? There are others who were persuaded by means of envy. So they were envious of Socrates. Mm. Mm. So they had their personal reasons, yes. Also, nobody appeared in his defense. And so people have been hearing these things for many years. They learned it since they were children. They've been hearing this. They've never heard anybody defend him. And... It becomes just this sort of common knowledge. There's no face attached to it, so there's no one, um, no accuser right. he can face, as you pointed out. And as you pointed out, sometimes people feel some envy or they have some other personal reason that he triggers them. And so there's this great anger. And so what we're going to see in his defense is that he wants to remove this prejudice. And so that's going to be the first part of his defense. It's broken up into sections. So we'll see that there's this introduction, and then he's going to make his defense or his, um, his, his um, attack on this prejudice. And then he's going to speak very shortly about the um, actual charges brought against him. And then we're going to see that in the last part, if a person is found guilty, then the jury goes back and they decide what the penalty will be. And so that will be the, the last part of the dialogue. Okay, so for these next few pages then, we're going to see Socrates trying to remove from the jury this prejudice against him. Arka, do you want to read on or do you want to pass to Jacob? Either way, Jacob, do you want to read? Sure, I, I, I take over for a while. Okay. 
Yeah, go ahead. Us. All right. Now, let us take up from the beginning the question, what the accusation is from which the false prejudice, prejudice against me has risen, and which Miletus uh, trusted when he brought this suit against me. What did those who aroused the prejudice say to arouse it? I must, as it were, read their sworn statement as if they were plaintiffs. Socrates is a criminal and a busybody, investigating the things beneath the earth and in the heavens and making the weaker argument stronger and teaching others these same things. Something of that sort it is. For you yourself saw that these things in Aristophanes' comedy as Socrates being carried about there, proclaiming that he was trending, treading on air and uttering a vast deal of other nonsense, about which I know nothing, either much or little. And I say this way, not sorry, to cast this... Sorry, oh. by the way, um, Aristophanes, he has a play called The Clouds, and you can actually find it online in English for free. There's, um, but he presents Socrates as... Um, yeah, like floating around on a cloud, and um, they're making fun of. In, in the dial in this dialogue, they're making fun of Socrates and his students, and they're doing something that sounds like yoga the way they're describing it, but they're um, making jokes about them. You know the way they contort their bodies and whatnot. So that's that reference there, and there was a reference earlier to a comedian, and I think that's also Aristophanes. And um, Aristophanes actually appears as a character in the dialogue Symposium. And Plato, it, it's pretty clear that Plato didn't like this guy. He even gave him hiccups. So that's, that's the reference there. Sorry, so you can, please go ahead. And I see. Sure, yeah. I remember in, in your book you said that that's one of the reasons we know that they did yoga, because mm -hmm. it wasn't really recorded anywhere right. you know yeah. explicitly by him so yes okay, okay. sorry oh, i didn't uh, know that yeah and, and i say this not to cast dishonor upon such knowledge if anyone is wise about such matters may i never have to defend myself against Miletus on on such on so great a charge as that but i men of athens have nothing to do with these things and I offer as witnesses most of yourselves, and I ask you to inform one another and to tell all those you have who ever heard me con conversing. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm going to read that again. All those of who of you who ha ever heard me conversing, and there are many such among you. Now tell if anyone ha ever heard me talking much or little about such matters. And from this, you will perceive that such are also the other things that the mul multitude say about me. But in fact, none of these things are true. And if you have uh, heard from anyone that I undertake to teach people and that I make money by it, that is not true either. Although this also seems to me to be a fine thing if one might be able to teach people as uh, Gorgias of Leotini and uh, Prodicus of Sios and Hippias of Elis are, for each uh, of these men, uh, gentlemen, is able to go into any one of the cities and persuade the young men who can associate for nothing with whomsoever they wish among their own fellow citizens to give up the association with the, those men and to associate with them and pay them money and be uh, grateful besides. And there is also another wise man here, a Parian, who I learned was in town. For I happened to meet a man who has spent more on sophists than all the rest. Callius, the son of Hipp Hipponicus. You get <laughs> so all I the asked good him. names. <laughs> yeah, good part. For, for he has two sons. Callius and I, if your two sons had happened to be two colts or two calves, we should be able to get and hire them an o overseer who would make them excellent in the kind of excellence proper to them. And he would be a horse trainer or a husbandman. But now, since they are two human beings, whom have you in mind to get as an overseer? 
Who has knowledge of that kind of excellence that a man and a citizen? For I think you have looked into the matter because you have have the sons. Is there anyone, said I, or not? Certainly, he said. Who, said I, and where from? And what is his price for his teaching? Even Eb- Evenus, he said, Socrates from Paros, five mene. And I called e- Evenus blessed if he really had this art and taught so reasonably. I myself should be vain and put on airs if I understood these things, but I do not understand them, men of Athens. Now perhaps someone might rejoin, but Socrates, what is the trouble about you? Whence have these prejudice, prejudices against you arisen? For certainly this great report and talk has not arisen while you were while you were doing nothing more out of the way than the rest, unless you were doing something other than most people. So tell us what is that what it is that we may not act unadvisedly in your case. The man who who says this seems to me to be right. And I will try to show you what it is that has brought about my reputation and aroused the prejudice against me. So listen, and perhaps I shall seem to you to be to be joking. Be assured, however, I shall speak perfect truth to you. The fact is, men of Athens, that I have acquired this reputation on account of nothing else than a sort of wisdom. What kind of wisdom is this? just that which is hap- is perhaps human wisdom, for perhaps I really am wise in this wisdom, and these men, perhaps, of whom I was just speaking, might be wise in some wisdom greater than human, or I don't know what to say, for I do not understand it, and whoever says I do is lying and speaking to arouse prejudice against me. And men of Athens, Do not interrupt me with noise, even if I seem to you to be boasting. For the word which I speak is not mine, but the speaker to whom I shall refer it is a person of weight. For of my wisdom, if it is wisdom at all, and of its nature, I will offer you the god of Delphi as a witness. You know Cherophon, I fancy. He was my comrade from youth and the comrade of your democratic party and shared in the recent exile, and came back to you. And you know that the kind of man Sheriffon was, how impetuous in whatever he undertook. Well, once he went to Delphi, and made so bold as to ask the oracle this question, and gentlemen, don't make me a disturbance at what I say, for he asked if there was anyone wiser than I. Than I. Now, the pith, Pithra? Pythia, Pythia. Repl- Pythia replied that there was no one wiser, and about these uh, things his brother here will bear you witness, since Sheriffon is dead. Okay, so sorry, from here now then Socrates mm-hmm. is going to tell a story, and keep in mind that one of the things he's accused of is not believing in the same gods, and so we want to see, is he giving proof that he does believe in them? Or is he actually fueling the fire of that accusation? Okay, you can go. Please go on. But see why I say these things, for I am going to tell you whence the prejudice against me has arisen. For when I heard this, I thought to myself, what in the world does the God, does the God mean? And what riddle is he propounding? For I am conscious that I am not wise, either much or little. What then does he mean by declaring that I am the wisest? He certainly cannot be lying, for that is not possible for him. And for a long time I was at a loss as to what he meant. Then, with great reluctance, I proceeded to investigate him somewhat as follows. I went to one of those who had a reputation for wisdom, thinking that there, if anywhere, I should prove the utterance wrong and should show... The oracle, this man is wiser than I, but you said I was wisest. So examining this man, for I need not call him by name, 
but it was one of the public men with regard to whom I had this kind of experience, men of Athens. And conversing with him, this man seemed to me to seem to be wise to many other people, and especially to himself, but, but not to be so. And then I tried to show him that he thought he was wise, but was not. As a result, I became hateful to him and to many of those present. And so, as I went away, I thought to myself, I am wiser than this man, for neither of us really knows anything fine and good, but this man thinks he knows something when he does not, whereas I, as I do not know anything, do not think I do either. I seem then, in just this little thing, to be wiser than this man at any rate, and what I do not know, I do not think I, I know either. From him, I went to another of those who were reputed to be wiser than he, and these same things seemed to me to be true, and there I became hateful both to him and to many others. Okay, and before we go on, so there's one of the most famous lines, of course, in this dialogue. Um, what I do not know, I do not think I know either. And there are many ways to understand that, but maybe the most, the way most people take it is that he doesn't claim to know anything. Um, he does say it just above that. I do not know anything. I do not think I do either. But again, as you think more about what knowledge is, the most specific definition of it, um, then you can start to maybe tweak your understanding of those lines. But for our purposes now, I think what is most interesting is that he wanted to prove the oracle wrong. That's what all of this is about. He did all of this because he wants to prove the oracle wrong. So the oracle here, the oracle at Delphi, is an oracle to the god Apollo. And to question the oracle, it's like questioning the pope. Why would he give this in his defense? <laughs> he's up on charges of not believing in the gods. And he's up there saying, oh, I questioned the oracle. I want to prove the oracle wrong. What do you think of that? I think he's trying to dispel the prejudice against him by saying he may be upset some powerful people. I think in uh, modern parlance, you'd call that a bit of a humble brag. <laughs> it is, yes. But it happens to be true. <laughs> so all these things did happen. So it may dispel the prejudice, but it's counter to the charges. So there are two things, right? He's fighting the prejudices against him and the charges. And so we have to keep in the, he hasn't yet talked about the charges, but this is something he's saying in his commentary on trying to dispel those prejudices. So it's a curious argument to be making at this time anyway. At the very least, we can say that. He doesn't really seem to... This, this, if you are a person who went in there thinking that maybe he really is a person who does not believe in the gods of Athens, this would not change your mind. <laughs> Put it that way. He's questioning the Pythia at the, at, um, the Oracle of Delphi. Yeah, very high priest, so priest or priestess, I think. I think it's a priestess, but here you think he used the masculine. But um, it would, it's a very strange argument to be making. I just wanted to point that out. And so now, yes, he's going to go on talking about the reaction he's had with his questioning. Um, do you want to keep going, Jacob, or do you want to pass it back to Arca? Pass it back. Okay. Do you mind, Arca, reading on? Sure, yeah. So after this. After this, then I went on from one to another, perceiving that I was hated and grieving and fearing, but nevertheless I thought I must consider the God's business of the highest importance. So I had to go investigating the meaning of the oracle to all those who are reputed to know anything. And by the dog, men of Athens, for I must speak the truth to you, this I do declare was my experience. 
Those who had the most reputation seemed to me to be almost the most efficient as I investigated at the gods' behest, and others who were of less repute seemed to be superior men in the matter of being sensible. So I must relate to you my wandering as I perform my Herculean labors, so to speak, in order that the oracle might be proved to be irrefutable. For after the public men, I went to the poets, those of tragedies and those of dithyrams, and the rest, thinking that there I should prove by actual test that I was less learned than they. So, taking up the poems of theirs that seemed to me to have been most carefully elaborated by them, I asked them what they meant, that I might at the same time learn something from them. Now I am ashamed to tell you the truth, gentlemen, but still it must be told. For there was hardly a man present, one might say, who would not speak better than they about the poems they themselves had composed. So again, in the case of the poets also, I presently recognized this, that what they composed, they composed not by wisdom, but by nature, and because they were inspired, like the prophets and givers of oracles. For these also say many fine things, but know none of the things they say. It was evident to me that the poets too had experienced something of the same sort, and at the same time I perceived that they, on account of their poetry, thought that they were the wisest of men in other things as well, in which they were not. So I went away from them, also thinking that I was superior to them in the same thing in which I excelled the public men. And remember that one of the people who brought charges against him was a poet. Finally, then I went to the handworkers, for I was conscious that I knew practically nothing, but I knew I should find that they knew many fine things, and in this I was not deceived. They did know what I did not, and in this, they, in this way they were wiser than I. But men of Athens, the good artisans, also seemed to me to have the same failings as the poets. Because of practicing his art well, each one thought he was very wise in the other most important matters. And this folly of theirs obscured that wisdom, so that I asked myself, in behalf of the oracle, whether I should prefer to be as I am, neither wise in their wisdom nor foolish in their folly, or to be in both respects as they are. I replied then to myself and to the oracle that it was better for me to be as I am. What do you think of that? So that conclusion there. Um... I was neither wise in their wisdom nor foolish in their folly. Would it be better to be like them or to be the way he was? And he chose to be the way he is. I'm just curious, what do either of you have any thoughts about that? I think uh, because they thought they were wise are perceived to be wise than they thought they were wise on matters that were outside of mm -hmm. what they should have thought they were wise on, mm -hmm. um, such, such as a rhetoric, you know, people that are skilled in re rhetoric maybe uh, thinking they can persuade the masses more than like a physician or someone who's mm -hmm. skilled in one thing but can't convey it to the masses mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and one of the accusers is a rhetorician, so, yes. Yeah, so it's kind of a stay in, know what you know and know what you don't know, he's saying there. So, maybe good advice. All right, um, I think just a little bit more to this part. We're going to have a transition to the current accusers in about two pages. So we got about two pages more of this. Uh, do you want to keep reading, Arka? Can I popcorn to Jacob? Okay. Sure. Sure. Mm. Uh, now, from this investigation, men of Athens, many uh, enmities en mm. have arisen against me, and such as are most harsh and grievous, so that many prejudices have resulted from them, and I am called a wise man. For on one such occasion... Those who are present think I am wise in the matters in which I confute someone else. But the fact is, gentlemen, it is likely that the god is really wise, and by his oracle means this. Human wisdom is of little or no value. And it appears that he does uh, not really say this of Socrates, but merely uses my name and makes me an example, as if he were to say, This one of you, O human, 
beings is what is wisest who like socrates recognizes that he is in truth of no account in respect to wisdom okay well, therefore oh oh sorry that's a conclusion there so now after explaining how he would go around questioning people this is the conclusion that he drew what do you think of this do you think he saved himself um his attack on the oracle trying to prove the oracle wrong does this save does this show him to be believing in the gods or by he says that the god is really wise and by his oracle means this does that show that he agrees with the oracle or is he changing what the oracle said I, th I think it sounds blasphemous because he's saying human wisdom has, is of little or no value, but I, I think the masses would consider themselves human wise. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it's like, why would the god say you're wise? And then you come to the conclusion that the gods. There's no such you know, thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, if you put it in a um, modern context, this is like saying, well, what the Bible's really saying is this. Which is kind of actually what religious leaders do, but they make it sound like they're 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 telling they're they're not they try to make it sound like they're not changing it. He didn't hide it very well. What he's really saying is this. Well, this is what it means. And so, yeah, it's open to interpretation. Some people may say, well, this is what religious leaders do. And others will say that this is blasphemous. He's trying to change it. Hmm. So this is something, anyway, that the 501 jurors are thinking about. Okay, um, shall we go on? Uh, therefore, I am still even now going about and searching and investigating at the gods' behest anyone, whether citizen or foreigner, who I think is wise. And when he does not seem to seem so to me, I give aid to the god and show that he is not wise. And by reason of this occupation, I have no leisure to attend to any of the affairs of the state worth, worth mentioning, or of my own but am in vast poverty on account of my service to the god. And in addition to these things, the young men who have the most leisure, the sons of the richest men, accompany me of their own accord, find pleasure in hearing people being examined, and often imitate me themselves. And then they, are, they undertake to examine others. And then, I fancy, they find a great plenty of people who think they know something, but know little or nothing. As a result, therefore, those who are examined by them are angry with me, instead of being angry with themselves, and say that Socrates is the most ab abominable person and is corrupting the youth. And does that actually help Socrates to point that out? That's an example of the very thing that he's accused of, isn't it? It is. <laughs> so he's giving evidence against himself. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he's, I mean, I think he's being sincere when he says that he is on the mission of the God. He, he's serving at the God's behest. Even at this stage, he cannot, he cannot do anything but tell the truth, mm -hmm. regardless of what, you know, fate brings upon him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what we're going to see is there's this um, play between the charges themselves, whether they're true or false, and then there's also the question of whether or not the charges are just. And fighting against that prejudice, then, is really fighting against whether or not the law itself is just. And we'll see that throughout here. We haven't even gotten to the actual charges yet. But we see here that the way he's behaving actually fits very much <laughs> the charges brought against him. But the question is, is it bad? Is it something that should be a crime? 
Okay, we got just a little bit more for this section. Maybe about a page more. Want to keep going? Or sure. Should, okay, thank you. Okay. And, and when anyone asks them, by doing or teaching what, they have nothing to say, but they do not know, and that they may not seem to be at a loss. They say these things that are handy to say against all the philosophers. The things in the air and the things beneath the earth, and not to believe in the gods, and to make the weaker argument the stronger. For they would not, I fancy, care to say the truth, and that it is being made very clear that they pretend to know, but know nothing. Since, then, they are jealous of their honor, and energetic, and numerous, and speak uh, concertedly and persuasively about me. They have filled your ears both long ago and now with vehement slanders. From among them, Miletus attacked me, and Anatus and Lycon, Miletus, uh, angered on account of the poets, and Anatus on account of the artisans, and the public men, and Lycon on account of the orators, so that, as I said in the beginning, I should be surprised if I were able to remove this prejudice from you in so short a time when it has grown so great. There you have the truth, men of Athens, and I speak without hiding anything from you, great or small, or prevacating, prevacating. Okay. And yet, I know pretty well that I am making myself hated by just this that conduct, all, which is also a proof that I am speaking the truth and that this is the prejudice against me, and these are its causes. And whether you investigate this now or hereafter, you will find that it is so. And that's the end of his um, defense to that first set of accusers, the ones from long ago. So what do you think? Has he achieved what he, do you think that, at least for you, does this achieve what um, he set out to achieve? I like that he pointed out mm -hmm. that, you know, what he was saying was the truth and mm -hmm. whether it makes him look good or bad, it, it is the truth. Mm -hmm. I think if you consider that if you consider that to be his goal, then he said he certainly succeeded admirably. Mm, okay, yes. And uh, how do you think it would sound to his, to his audience, the 501? So he's basically using this time. He's on, so he's been accused of various things. He's, he's got to try to convince this jury that um, he's not corrupting the youth and um, he doesn't believe in, he does believe in the gods of the state, I should say. And so that's what he has to, to argue against. But he chooses to use this time to make a defense of philosophy, of what he's doing. So this is not the way spiritual people behaved in his day and even in our day. We need to apply this now to modern times. If somebody went around doing what he's doing, um, I think they would get very much the same reaction. And so he's using this time, we can see here, to make his defense of, of philosophy. And so that's really what the dialogue is about. And so we're going to see, even as we go on and we get into the actual charges, we'll see even more clearly that... Um, that the way that the state approaches spirituality is very different from the way Socrates does. And I think it's significant who his accusers are. Um, you can see at the top of the page, it's page 91 in my text. I'm not sure in, in yours if it, it's somewhere close to that. Yeah. At the top of this page, um, you see that Miletus was angered on account of the poets. And we've seen in other dialogues that the poets often would quote Homer or Hesiod or, you know, other spirit, they would make spiritual references. And so they were considered spiritual people. And then Anatus on the count of the artisans and the public men, um, 
less so, but then Lycon on account of the orators. And orators also, or rhetoricians, would also often make references to Homer the way modern day politicians, you know, make references to the Bible. And so they also want to show themselves as spiritual. And so there's a certain accepted spirituality. And we're going to see, and we get into the next paragraph here, where the actual accusations come up, that Socrates' approach to spirituality is very different. And even he already introduced it, the idea of even questioning the oracle, of wanting to prove the oracle wrong. That's actually, by the way, the approach that we as students want to have going into these kinds of works or talking to a teacher that you don't just blindly follow, but you don't just dismiss. And he had said, actually, I'm going to go back just a little bit because he did have a really good line back on page 81, which is 21B for anyone on YouTube who doesn't have the same text. Um, he says back here that... Um, He says, um, I'm conscious I'm not wise, either much or little. What then does he mean by declaring that I am the wisest? He certainly cannot be lying, for that is not possible for him. And so he's saying there he won't just dismiss what the oracle said. He has great respect for the oracle, for the oracle's wisdom. He can't believe that the Pythia would be lying to him. And also even to think that the Pythia is wrong is something he can't openly just... Like if anyone else said it to him, it's easy to just dismiss, right? Well, that's a dumb idea. But it's the Pythia who said it. You can't dismiss it. But he's not going to just blindly believe it either. And so he has to test it and understand in what way the Pythia meant that. And that was his conclusion when he said, here's what the Pythia really means. This is what it means to say... Socrates is the wisest. And so that's very much the way that we as students approach philosophy. But it's not the way that people in his day or even people in mainstream society today approach spirituality. So a very different approach, and that's what's really on trial here. Any, any thoughts before we go on? Or? I don't mean to just be making speeches. If you want to jump in and say anything, feel free anytime. Otherwise, we'll go on to the next paragraph. Maybe I'll just read this one, give you guys a break. So I'm back on page 91 at 24b. He's going to now introduce the charges against him. So this next section is the, dealing with the current accusations. Now, so far as the accusations are concerned, which my first accusers made against me, this is a sufficient defense before you, but against Miletus, the good and patriotic, as he says, and the later ones, I will try to defend myself next. So once more, as if these were another set of accusers, let us take up in turn their sworn statement. So this is the sworn statement that these three men gave to the court against Socrates and why they're in court now. And it is about as follows. It states that Socrates is a wrongdoer because he corrupts the youth and does not believe in the gods the state believes in, but in other new spiritual beings. Now, a curious thing here, if you look at the Greek, is that the word for new spiritual beings is diamo diamonia, a form of daimon. So it's the plural of daimon. So he believes in daimons. And that is something the state is very much offended by, or at least these three men. Do you see, without um, before I jump in here, but do you see um, why that would be a threat to them? Are you familiar with um, Socrates talking about his daimon? That was the the voice that always asked him a question, mm -hmm. right? Mm. 
the voice that would come I forget in. the specifics yes. of it. Yeah. yeah, we're actually going to get it very soon. He does say a bit about it here. But, yeah, I think everyone is familiar with the idea that Socrates said he heard a voice. And that was his daimon. Why would that be a threat to these three men? Jacob, I think you were going to say something before. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, naively, I would think it's uh, just because they're spiritual beings that are different than the gods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like saying that there's something else to mm -hmm. than like God to mm -hmm. Christian. They'd be like, ah, mm -hmm. that's there's no way. Mm -hmm. So okay, yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, Arca, any other anything to add to that? I mean, presumably, the accusation would paint him as a barbarian, essentially, right? Someone who's mm. so completely deluded as to not even be Greek anymore, at least by their standards, by the Athenian standards of this day. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, another thing to think about, I think those are both good points. Um, another thing to think about is that if you are, if you are in touch with a daimon, and you're getting spiritual advice from a daimon. Do you need the priests the same way you did before? Will the poets and the orators have the same impact on your life? Suppose not. No. <laughs> There's a certain freedom, right? If we each, if we don't need someone to tell us what Homer meant, if we don't need someone else to interpret it for us. That's a threat to them. And that's really actually what he described in the way that he dealt with the oracle. Do you see the parallel there? Yeah, he'd be following... The, his da his daimon instead of believing in Apollo. Uh. Well, it's not that he doesn't believe in Apollo. Actually, in another dialogue, the Phaedo, he does say that he's a follower of Apollo. So it's not that he doesn't um, believe in Apollo. It's more that he doesn't just accept the face value interpretation, if you will, of what the oracle said. He wants to understand for himself, what does that mean? And that's very much, I think, what all of us are doing in studying philosophy and trying to better understand these ideas. I mean, we can study metaphysics and just say, okay, there's this um, first cause and then there's reality unfolds in a certain way and, and you're done. But we know that that's not really enough. That's just a belief, and it's just, um, it, it's just telling yourself a story. You're not necessarily living it. You're not experiencing it. So you can have religion without spirituality. And so can I ask a question? Yes, please. Mm. So, so it, it's a bit convoluted, but it, it relates to this in the end. Mm. Um, okay. To return back to the previous dialogue, uh, Mino, mm -hmm. um, when he's talking to, when, when Socrates is talking to Mino, I think he references the, the mysteries, right? And that Mino was not present for the initiation into that. Yes. So this is just my thought, but would it, would it not be possible that the, the enlightenment obtained through initiation into the mysteries and the practice of the mysteries would be how you cultivate this daimon of which everyone else is so afraid? And their fear of it is because they themselves don't have the true knowledge of the religion. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly right. And to emphasize that even more, I'm going to go back to the charges for a moment. Because he says that one of the charges is that he does not believe in the gods the state believes in. Belief. It's about belief. Their idea of spirituality is you believe. So there are a lot of parallels to today, right? that it's all about believing. And in fact, for many, for many people, having, in looking at modern 
society, the way religion is treated today, is having faith is what is most um, spiritual, if you will. That they see that as like to believe the unbelievable is proof that you are one of the the good ones who will be saved. I've heard many people try to defend the Bible in that way, that, that the fact that it, you can point out all these flaws in the story, at least, at least on the surface story, and I think there is something wrong with taking it at face value. It is more of a myth, I think. But to, to point out flaws in at least the surface story of the whole Jesus myth, for example, um, it's often defended by saying that um, to be able to believe it, even though it doesn't make sense, is proof of your deep faith. And so this very much, um, this dialogue here, very much um, is a response to that, right? that kind of thinking. So yeah, what he's accused of is just believe, is that he doesn't believe. And I think we need to emphasize the word believe. And that does tie to your point, Arka, about the Mino, that Mino didn't want to be initiated. He didn't want to have that kind of deep connection. It was enough for him just to do like what the uh, rhetoricians and the poets do and just talk about it. So a lot of parallels to today, don't you think so? In a way, it's kind of um, depressing, maybe, that we haven't learned or grown any. We're still in the same place. <laughs> same problems. It, it, it reminds me a bit, actually, of... Um, forget the name of the author, but... He wrote a book about the last pagan generation of Rome, and he released a, a, a shorter, like, summary article of it on Eon, I think, online. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of reminds me of the attitude that the the late, you know, the last generation of Roman pagans took towards the the, the dissolution of their religion. Uh, they they were primarily engaged in politics. Uh, to, and you know, missed the the rise of the coming new religion, and so it was far too late for them to actually change anything. Mm. Oh, okay. And by that time, their temples were destroyed, their sacrifices were banned, all of the rites and rituals in which they had engaged, uh, sort of mechanistically or unthinkingly for so long, were were gone, and they realized that they lost everything else along with that. Yeah, yeah. There's a really a war against pagan religions, isn't there? Uh, some friends of mine went to Greece some years ago, and they were saying, like, a lot of the places where there had been pagan temples, churches were built on top of them. Like, they were torn down, and then churches built on top so that no one will ever ex excavate underneath because, you know, it's a church, it's a holy place, and so... It's a way of just completely erasing their history. There is a big controversy about mm -hmm. that, that going on in India right now oh. with a mosque that was built over the side of a temple. And just recently, people are starting, like, videos and pictures are coming out of what is very clearly Hindu iconography on wow. uh, parts of the mosque. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. It's really sad the way all these, you know, religions fighting each other about the differences or different interpretations and no and they're not looking at what connects us all and what is true in all of these systems. But, okay, why don't I think we should leave it there for today because now we're going to get into it's a nice transition there. We're going to get into the current accusations and uh, we'll pick that up then from next week. So um, for those of you watching on YouTube, thank you for joining us. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those below. And also please like the stream and please um, subscribe if you don't already. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.